John chapter number 20, chapter 21. And I want to begin reading around verse number 3. Actually, verse 2. Uh, John chapter 21. And I want to begin around verse number 2. For those of you who are joining us by way of delayed television, uh, this is Bethel. Thank you for worshiping with us today. Uh, this is a Bethel Baptist Church. We're located in the Collegeville community of the city of Birmingham. The address is 3228th Avenue North. The phone number is 205-322-5360. If you'd like to worship with us on the World Wide Web, it's www.bethelcollegeville.org. This is our normal Sunday morning 10 o'clock worship service. We meet every Sunday at 10 o'clock for worship. We're here at 8.30 for Sunday school on Wednesdays. We're here at 12 noon for our noonday Bible study. And then again at 7 o'clock for our uh, night Bible study. So please, if you have an opportunity, come and join us. Bethel Baptist Church, 3200 28th Avenue North. Uh, today we're looking at the book of John, the gospel according to John. And I want to begin at verse number 2, and I will read down to verse number 9. John chapter 21, beginning at verse number 2, and reading down to verse number 9. Do you have it? Yes. Anybody need any more time? Okay, let's follow along as I read. There were together Simon, Peter, and Thomas called Didymus, and Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee, the two and two other of the disciples. Simon Peter saith unto them, I go a fishing. They say unto him, We also go with thee. They went forth and they entered into a ship immediately, and that and that night they caught nothing. But when the morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. Then Jesus said unto them, Children, have ye any meat? They answered, No. They answered him, No. And he said unto them, Cast the net on the right side of the ship, and ye shall find. They cast therefore, and now they were not able to draw it for the multitude of fishes. Therefore that disciple whom Jesus loved saith unto Peter, It is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girt, himself, he girt his fisher's coat upon him, unto him, for he was naked, and he cast himself into the sea. And the other disciple came in a little ship, for they were not far from land, but as it were two hundred cubits, or about 134 yards, dragging the net with fishes. As soon then as they were come to land, they saw a fire of coals there, and fish lay thereon, and bread. You may be seated. I want to begin our year uh, talking to you uh, regarding the theme that we have adopted for this year. Uh, for those of you that were here on watch night, uh, you know that, that uh, we've adopted the theme, uh, the year of higher callings, higher callings, getting to the point where we are pursuing the higher callings of God and not just being satisfied or content to, to fish in the shallow end. Uh, we want to, as Jesus told his disciples, launch out into the deep. Uh, and as we look at going into higher callings, I wanted to use this particular backdrop of scriptures to share some things with you about pursuing your higher calling and the kind of thoughts, the kind of decisions, the kind of actions that is going to take to pursue higher callings. We are urged in several other scriptures to pursue the deeper things of God. Uh, Pastor Chestnut this morning read in Colossians 3 uh, about if you then be risen with Christ, seek the things that are above, what Christ sits on the right hand of God, and that we are to set our affections on things above. Jesus told his disciples as he was calling them that once they had accepted the way of the kingdom that they needed to be on guard because there would be things that would enter in and that they would choke the word and that the word would become unfruitful. 
as we look at Paul's writing, he wrote to Timothy as a young pastor in 2 Timothy chapter 2. He said, no man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life so that he might please him who has called him to be a soldier. And on and on and on it goes. There are a number of scriptures that talk to us about the fact that it is important that we not be entangled, that it is important that we continue to, to grasp after God and to go after him, and that we should not be satisfied with, Paul calls it, the beggarly elements, the, the elementary things. Again, in Hebrews it says, therefore, leaving, leaving the, the simple things, leaving the elementary things, let's go on to perfection. Let's go on to maturity. Let's go on to a divine level that God has called us into. And so this year, I want to begin uh, to challenge us to, to pursue the deeper things, to pursue the higher callings, to go for the things that God has called us into. And as we go there, there are some things that we need to consider, and I'll, I'll talk about those in just a few minutes. But let's get a backdrop of where we are today in our scripture. Jesus has been crucified. The disciples have run away, and they are in a place where they are a little bit afraid because the Jews and some of the Romans have threatened them. Uh, now that Jesus is gone, there is no natural leader. There is not one to hold the disciples together and to keep them going in the direction that God had wanted them to go through the person of Jesus Christ. The last time Jesus had appeared to them, which was the second time he appeared to them, they were together in a room and Thomas was there. And I believe that Jesus appeared to them for the sake of Thomas because he begins by talking to Thomas about the virtue of believing and not seeing. And so after that had occurred, this is now the third time that he's appeared to them in that 40-day time span in which he was upon the earth. During that time, though, Thomas and the disciples are together. Uh, Peter comes to the conclusion that I need to go fishing. Whether it was for food or whether he had gotten to the point where now he wants to go back into life as normal, we don't know. All we know is that Peter is such a leader that he says to the disciples, I'm going fishing. And the rest of the disciples, some of them are not natural fishermen, said, okay, we'll go with you. And so they go out, and now they are out fishing. And this is where I want to pick up with in terms of things that we need to think about, things that we need to be aware of if we're going to indeed pursue a higher calling, the higher calling of God. Please understand that God has called all of us into a higher calling. Every single one of us. There's not one person that God called and say, now I want you to stay exactly where I called you until I come back to get you. Every single one of us. He said, follow me. And I will make you, I will transform you. You will go through a metamorphosis until you have become fishers of men. When he left the church, he said, I don't want you to make necessarily Christians. I want you to make disciples. I want you to win them. And then I want you to take them through the process of getting them ready to be serviceable in the kingdom. And so you just coming in and deciding that I'm going to be a church, good church member is not acceptable. Amen. Not with God. He is calling us into the deep. And then again, just to give us a little bit more incentive, Jesus told us over and over again, many are called. What's the rest of the verse? Few are chosen. Many are called, but few are chosen. Paul says of himself, I run. Not like somebody, or I fight rather, not like somebody who's beating the air. I'm not shadow boxing, but I'm making each of my punches count. I'm, I'm, I'm doing whatever is necessary so that after I have spent my life preaching to others, when it comes time for me to be judged, I won't be a castaway. So we have to ro go to a higher calling. First thing that, I, that we need to think about when it comes to higher calling as we look at this story is this. The greatest time, the greatest temptation for you to go back into the lower things is when you come to a period of transition in your life. 
Amen. The disciples, that's where they were. They were in a period of transition. They had a decision. They could either go higher with God or they could go lower. Now, transitions come about as a result of three primary things. I'm going to just summarize here just so we can get all of this together. Three things happen when, or three things occur that causes us to be in transition. First of all, disappointment. When things don't happen the way you think they ought to happen. When life as you imagine it is not life as it is. When Jesus said he was going to build a kingdom and all of you are going to be sitting on 12 thrones and now he is dead. And we're all disappointed. Or you pray that somebody would live and they did not live and they died anyway and you put all of your faith in God on the scripture it says if you ask anything it shall be done and since God did not fulfill your prayer the way you thought that God should fulfill your prayer now you're disappointed and the evil one comes to you and he says to you you're not as spiritual as you think you are or following God doesn't work well, like Joseph, you tell all your brothers as, as God has given you this dream that, that the sun and the moon are going to bow down to you and before you know it, you end up in a prison. Amen. And you're disappointed. Or right, you finally got the blessing you thought God wanted you to have and that blessing does not turn out to be all that you thought it ought to be and now you are disappointed. Disappointments come to all of us in life. And it is a critical time in your life. What you do with your disappointment, what you do in that period of transition, many times will determine whether you go further into God or whether you shrink back and go back to where you came from. Like Peter, whether it is because of necessity or because he's at a point of disappointment, he has said to the disciples, I'm going back to fishing. I'm going back to fornicating. Because living the way God tells me to live does not work. I'm disappointed. I try to do right. I can't do right. And now it's better for me to go back in the world the way I was before I got here. Disappointments. It's a critical time of transition. And if you don't discipline your disappointments, your disappointments will lead you back into the world. If you don't discipline those times when things don't happen the way you think they ought to happen, they'll lead you back into the world. When you've done right and evil follows, if you don't have enough intestinal fortitude to know that in the end it's going to work out, it will lead you back into those times when you live the way you wanted to live. The second area that causes people to go back into the world and not pursue the higher callings is not just disappointments, but the times of what I call delay. It's not that God is saying no, it's just that it's going to take a little longer. It's going to take a little longer. It's going to take longer than you think it's going to take. And because things don't happen the way you think they ought to happen, or as soon as you think they ought to happen, like the virgins who did not have enough oil for their lamps in the critical hour of delay. You get mad and you go, go away. Be careful during those times of transition. It happens in your life when you go from adolescence to teen life. Sometimes you get to a, to a stage of transition. In that stage of transition, you either decide to go on with God or you go back with God. Or you get married and sometimes in that marriage, instead of going on with God, you, you fall away from God. Or maybe you become divorced or widow and instead of going on with God, you go back with God. All of those delays and disappointments of life can cause you to come to a period of time where you are transitioning and it is important to stay with God during that transition. Amen. Amen. Some people come to midlife. Amen. Been in church all their lives. But they finally begin to see their mortality. And they think that a lot of things in life I haven't done. And I want to do some of them things before I die. Well, and some of those things are not good things. Amen. But you just want to do them before you die. 
You yeah. just want to do them before you die. Yeah. Because you've come to a point in your life where you see your own mortality. And if you don't discipline that, it can lead you to falling away from God. Amen. Peers of transitions. Point number one is the most, time, the most critical time in your life for making a decision to follow God, to go into the higher commitments or stay away is during those times of transition. Peter and the disciples were at a time of transition. Point number two is what I want to share from verse number three. Verse number three, coming very close to verse number one, uh, coming, point number two coming very close to point number one, is that you're most likely to make a decision to go back to what you know if you don't pursue the higher calling. Peter said, I know fishing, let's go back to fishing. Be careful whenever you decide to go back into something that Jesus called you out of. Be very careful when you make a decision to go back into something that Jesus called you out of. Now Jesus had called them out of fishing. So now that he's gone, why would you go back? Paul makes the same argument when he deals with the Galatian church. He has called you out from under the law. Why would you go back under the law? Why would you now be perfected in the law when God has called you out of the law? And he asks the question, did you receive the Holy Spirit under the law? Did you receive healing, I'm making this up, under the law? Did you get delivered out of whatever it was you were delivered out of under the law? The answer was no. Now, I'm, I'm going to make a point later. There are some times that God may send you back to some things with a higher revelation, with a higher understanding, so that you can do what you should have been doing the first time. But if you make a conscious decision to go back into something that God has delivered you out of, there is some question in you, it should be some question in your mind, as to whether or not I'm pursuing a higher calling or I'm falling back into what's comfortable. Because whenever you are challenged, to go higher or to stay where you are, it is the easiest thing in the world to go back into what is most comfortable. Amen. Point number three. I have seven of them. I'm going to try to get all seven. If I don't, I'll give you as much as I can. Point number three. Higher callings from verse five. Higher callings are to fill you with substance and maturity. Verse number five. Jesus comes to them and he says this, children, do you have any meat? Now, the term there for children, is, the Greek uses lots of different words for one English word. One word for children is the word as a child who is under two years old. There's another word for a child who is young and up and walking. There's another word for a child that has not yet reached the age of maturity but yet they are still a child. This word child is the same word that's used when the, when the wise men were going to seek Jesus, the young child, meaning a child more than likely under two years of age. And he's not here talking about their chronological age, he's talking about their, their age of maturity, spiritual maturity. And he uses the term, little children, do you have any meat? Again, the Greek word there is not necessarily a word that talks about meat, meat, but in, in, in the context of this scripture, uh, the Jewish culture, they would have bread as a meal, bread and water, and then they would have something of substance, which was meat. And what Jesus is asking them is, do you have any substance? Well. Point number three, again, higher callings are to bring about in your life maturity and substance. You cannot live your life spiritually off of bread and water. Jesus, when he was talking about the children's bread, or children's portion, he talked about bread. But then Paul goes on in Hebrews and he says, strong meat belongs to those who are of full age. Just like you wouldn't give a two-year-old two-bone steak, a T-bone steak, because their mouth 
can, and the teeth and the stomach generally cannot digest it. So Jesus asked a question of them. Are you at the point in your search where you are mature and whether you have substance to your life? Do you have substance to your life? Or are you the same shallow person that you were when you were born again? Well, you cry like a baby then and people hurt your feelings? Well, you cry like a baby now people hurt your feelings. I'm not saying that people should be cruel to you. I'm not saying that you should not have feelings. But what I am saying is that when you come a little bit older, you realize that hurt feelings are just a part of the process. You realize that. You realize if you're going to leave, as Paul told Timothy, you have to endure hardness as a good soldier. You realize that if, particularly if you're going to be a parent, you cannot worry about what it looks like today. You have to know what's down the road and you have to leave for what's down the road. Because the same children who say you're the meanest old mother and father that ever lived 20 years from now are going to come back and say thank you for being the only daddy or the only mama in town that would not let us go out and do everything and run around with everybody. But if you are not, you do not have that substance in your life to where you can do what right because it is right you will be forever rowing around looking for food God calls us in the higher things because he wants us to have meat and maturity meat and maturity so what if they're saying ugly things about you so what? Does it change who God is? Does it change God's ability to provide for you? Does it change the destiny that God has called you into? Does it change the grace of God that is there for you? And the answer to all of those questions is no. It does not in any way. God wants us to come to a point so that we're not easily tossed to and fro, the Bible says, carried about with every wind of doctrine. Higher callings are to give you maturity and substance. Point number four. I'm going through them. Verse nine. After they finished, or after they had seen Jesus, they came to the shore. And in verse number nine, it says, as soon as they will come to the land, they saw the fire of coals there, and fish laid thereon, and bread. Point number, nine, point number four about higher callings is this. The essence of what you are looking for has already been provided and prepared if you pursue the higher calling. The essence of what you need, the essence of what you're looking for. They were out fishing, looking for food. Jesus saw them, told them how to get more food out of the net, but then when he came to shore, they already saw what they had been fishing all night for, already prepared, without any effort on their part. Now again, a little bit later, he does say, now give me what you have. But the key is this, what you're looking for, what you're searching for, what you're compromising for, God already has prepared for you. Without your efforts, without your labor, it's already laid out for you. The money that you are holding back from God trying to find, God already has prepared for you. There is not a shortage of funds in this world for any project that God ever wants to do in your life. Not a shortage anywhere. There's not a shortage of people. There's not a shortage of enemies. There's not a shortage of friends. There's not a shortage of anything you need. But it's found in you pursuing the higher calling. One of the things I said on watch night is that sometimes God uses an enemy to point you out. Wow. 
Not because he's trying to pick on you, but because that's the way he is using the enemy to get people to come to you. Sometimes your friends won't promote you. So he has to use an enemy to do it. Sometimes your friends won't say the good things that are going on in church, so he raises up an enemy to do it. And people will start coming, or the news media will start coming out, not because of the voice of your friends, but the voice of your enemies. Amen. But if you're so angry at your enemies, and you're so angry at the way God is doing it, that you can't accept what God is doing, then you miss the whole thing that God is trying to do in your life. Everything that you need, everything that you're pursuing, everything that you long for, is already provided. But it's only to be found when you pursue God's higher calling. Samson wanted to kill his enemies, but he was blind. God used a little man, a little person rather, to lead him to the pillars of the temple. And the Bible says he pushed down the temple uh, where all these people were gathered together to, to do him, uh, to mock at him. And the Bible says he killed more people in his death than he did in his life. He killed more people in his shame in his humiliation than he did with all of his life. But God already had a little boy there who would guide him to the place where he needed to be. Whatever is needed in your life, God has already provided, it is already there, but you have to pursue God's higher calling in order for you to get there, in order for you to find it. It's already there. Stop pursuing money, stop pursuing love, stop pursuing this or that, stop pursuing things. The Bible says it very clearly. Jesus said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and what? All these things. All these things will be added unto you. The people that you need, they're already there. The person that you need to be your promoter is already there. The person that you need to lift you up is already there. The person that you need to have favor with, God has already provided those people. All you need to do is see God, and when you see God, God will open up the door, and everything you need will be provided, but you have to seek God for his higher calling. Point number, where am I? Five comes from verse number 15, verses 15 through 17. Verses 15 through 17, as you know the verse, I did not read them. But Jesus asked Peter three times, do you love me? And during those three times, he asked him to do a different assignment. Feed my sheep, feed my lambs, tend my sheep, whatever the case. Sometimes, point number five, sometimes though, in order to go to a higher calling, you have to take care of uh, doing or, or correcting previous mistakes. This is what keeps people from going higher. Jesus puts it this way. We've heard, we've talked about it before. He said, if you're coming to the altar and you have a gift, in order to get the best benefit out of your gift, you need to go back and get things straight with the person you know is not right with you. Most of us will leave our gift because I ain't speaking to them. I want to go higher than you, but I ain't talking to them. If it takes me making peace with them, then I'll just stay where I am because I don't like them. They said such and such and such and such a thing about me. And I ain't speaking to them. I know we go to the same church. I know, but we always sit on opposite sides of the church. And I pray to you and I fast before you and I dance before you and I lift up my hands before you. But if you tell me to go talk to them, I'm going to stay right where I am because I don't like them. It's hard, isn't it? But it's true. Jesus asked Peter to go back. He denied him three times. So I want you to confess three times that you love me. I want you to commit again to what I called you to do. I want you to take care of the lower level stuff first. I want you to go back and recommit 
to what you were supposed to be doing at the beginning. Because see, you want to get all spiritual and you want to get all speaking in tongues and you want to have all kinds of great revelations and you want to lay hands on the sick and you want to do this, but you don't want to speak to your brother-in-law. I have speaking in tongues for you. I have laying of hands of the sick for you. I have prophecy for you, but I need you to go back and I need you to straighten things out with your brother-in-law. And the person that you offended yesterday, I need you to go back and straighten it out. And that's why a lot of people drop it. Because our pride is bigger than our desire to have a greater calling of God and to seek the higher things of God. Our pride is so big that it consumes sometimes our whole concept of what God is. Sometimes, in order to go higher, you have to go lower. Sometimes if God's going to build a big building, and they do it in construction, they don't start by going up. They start by going down. Jesus uh, inspired these words, humble yourself, therefore under the mighty hand of God, and he will lift you up in due time. And he says, whosoever exalts himself shall be abased, but whosoever humbles himself shall be exalted. Higher callings means that sometimes we have to go back and correct things that should have been corrected all along, but they were not corrected, and they have to be addressed. When you go into our fast that we're about to start on January 10th, one of the things, I will tell you right now, one of the things that God is going to deal with you about the first several days of your fast is your sin. Well, man. It's not odd. It's not strange. Don't think it's strange. The first thing that God generally deals with us about is our sin. Why does he deal with our sin? Because in order for him to take us higher, he's got to deal with all this mess that stops us from going higher. Amen. Hallelujah. And if your fast is like mine, I spend the first two or three days just acknowledging my sin. Daniel, as he was fasting before God, and many of you will follow the Daniel fast, you'll see one of the first things he started doing. He said, Lord, I confess before you that, that I'm a sinner. I confess before you that my people have sinned. We've not listened to your prophets. We've not honored you. We've gone after strange gods. And he spends all this time just confessing and acknowledging his sins because sometimes before you can go higher, you got to go lower. Before you can pursue a higher calling, you got to recommit to what God has called you to right now. And if you're not willing to recommit to the relationships that God has called you to right now, it's going to be very difficult for you to go into higher callings. Point number six from verses 18 and 19. Jesus says to Peter, Peter, when you were young, basically you did what you wanted to. But now that you're older, when you get older, people are going to take you to a place where you don't want to go. And it says that he told Peter this to signify the kind of death that he should die, verse 19. And with his death, he would have glorified God. Point number six. Higher callings require a commitment to crucify certain parts of your life. Certain parts of your life, if you're going to pursue a higher calling, God is going to put to death. Some of those things, he is going to resurrect. Some of them are going to stay dead. Paul was given these instructions by Jesus. I am going to deliver you from the people so that I can send you to the people. I'm going to kill your desire to be liked by the Jews and everybody else. And when I kill that, 
then I can send you to them. But as long as you're concerned about being liked by them, I can't send you over there. Because their acceptance or their rejection of you will determine what you will and what you will not preach. So I need to get you to the point where you really don't care. Because it's only when that's dead that you can be an effective witness. Higher callings means, Paul, the Jews are going to think you're crazy. But that's when you'll be free. When they think you're crazy. Higher callings, Jacob, means I've got to separate you from your mother. Because you and your mother think you can get anything by conniving and everything else. So unless you release that part of your life to me, I can't call you up higher. I can't show you that I can do it because you're constantly pulling at mama to do it. Daniel, if you're going to be the kind of man that I need you to be, I've got to separate you and you will become a eunuch. But when you become a eunuch and you have nobody else to depend upon, then you'll depend upon me. And when you depend upon me, then I'll show you not only things that are happening here, but I'll show you things that are going to happen in the future. But there's certain parts of your life I've got to crucify. Jeremiah, I've got to get you to the point where you cry over the people. I've got to get you to the point where you understand how I feel so that when you understand how I feel, then you can be the man that I want you to be. Ezekiel, I'm going to tell you up front, your wife is going to die. But out of that hole in your heart, I'm going to create something there that you can be, as your name indicates, my messenger. But there's a certain part of your life that I have to deal with before I can take you higher. Okay. Let's shift to the New Testament, John chapter 15. Jesus said, every branch in me that beareth fruit, he purges it. He cuts off certain things. Why does he do that? Because he wants to inflict pain? No, because he knows that you can bear much fruit. Amen. Higher callings means the willingness to allow certain parts of your life to be crucified. As I said, some of those things God will give back to you in a resurrected form. Some of those things you'll never see again because he wants to kill them. Higher callings will always cost you something. And that's why many people don't pursue higher callings, because of what it costs. Point number seven from verses 20 and 23. Higher calling, pursuing a higher calling, means being faithful to God's calling on your life without comparative regard to his callings for others. After Jesus just told Peter that basically you're going to be crucified, they're going to take you to a place where you don't want to go. He looks at John. He says, what's, what's John going to do? Jesus says, if I will that he tarry till I come. What is that to you? Well. You follow me. Sometimes the reason we don't go higher is that we look at others' lives, be it good or bad, and we say, I want my life like theirs. And God says, no, I didn't call your life to be like theirs. I didn't call you to be like them. They have their own cross to bear. They have their own issues to deal with. They have their own challenges in life. I called you to be what I called you to be. And if I called you to be this, then I want you to be that. And you cannot compare what I'm doing in somebody else's life because truthfully, you don't know what I'm doing in their lives. You don't know whether they seem happy or not, whether they are happy or not. They may smile, but it does not mean that their life is any less 
challenging than yours. They have their cross. You have yours. And every man will be rewarded. Every woman will be rewarded by bearing their own cross. Higher callings means that whatever God calls me to, I have to do that. And sometimes I know as pastors we are very, very guilty of it. We look at what another pastor is doing and we say, I want to be like that. I was out at Faith Chapel the other night and I was just looking at the great facility and I'd gone before and Pastor Mike uh, showed me you know, the youth facility and all the other stuff and, 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 and you begin to look and you say, mm. <laughs> but God calls you where he calls you yes. and you be faithful where God has called you because you may not be able to deal with all them folks that he has to deal with. <laughs> You be faithful to where God has called you. You do your best what God has called you. You, you. you share what God has called you to share. You be married to who God has called you to be married to. Bar an old Joe Tex song, because she may not be as good as she looks. You walk in the walk that God has called you. He has graced you and given you the ability to walk where he has called you. And the only way you're going to be fulfilled and to pursue your higher calling is to live in the grace that he has provided you for the walk that he has called you to walk. But I guarantee you, if you pursue God's higher calling, there's not one thing, one good thing, that God will withhold from you. Not one good thing. The scripture says no good thing will he withhold from those that walk uprightly. Not one single good thing. But it's going to cost. It's going to cost. You have to be willing to let go of the peanuts in this hand in order for God to give you something great. I close with this illustration. I've used it before. One of the ways that they used to trap monkeys in the jungle is that they take a coconut, hollow it out, and they put peanuts in the coconut shell. The monkeys would take the peanut, take the shell, and shake it. Of course, and they hear the peanuts rattling, and they stick their hand in and they grasp the peanuts. Well, when they have the peanuts in their fist, they can't get their fist back out of the hole. And so they'd have a string attached to the shell and they would just lead the monkey all, uh, lead them wherever they wanted them to go simply because they would not let go of the peanuts. And if they, all they had to do is just let go of the peanuts and the hand would slip just as easily out as it slipped in. But because the fist was grasped and they were unwilling to let go, they were captured and ensnared. Some of us have got our hands around peanuts. And God is saying to you, let it go. Open up your hand, let it go. I have greater things for you. I have higher callings for you. But you must let go of the peanuts. And until you let go of the peanuts, and unless you let go of the peanuts, you will always be ensnared. And that's why God allows sometimes areas of your life to be crucified. Because those are the things that ensnare you. Those are the things that ensnare you. You've not learned to be alone, but yet not lonely. Well... And because you're so busy looking for somebody to validate you, <laughs> Satan brings the wrong one with a counterfeit validation and you are ensnared and you cannot get out because you're unwilling to let go. And that's why God says, let me, let me show you how to be alone successfully. And when you can be alone successfully, 
You can be with somebody else and not feel alone. Because you're not looking for them to do what only God can do for you. Higher callings. Let's pursue them this year with everything we have. Let's pray. Father, thank you.